Um, I feel very privileged that I grew up in Chadsley many, many years ago when it was still very much a village stuck in the past. It hadn't changed really the main part of the village for many decades. And it was very interesting for me as a schoolboy. I was walked to school past all the old houses, the cottages, still had all the shops, the cobbler was still there. So Chatsley has a big place in my heart. It's also fitting that I'm giving this talk in this building tonight because the person that built it is the reason that I'm here, and I'll come on to that. So this is a, a sort of a mixed tale of two families, and hopefully you can follow it through. And the centre of that talk are two great great granddads. So we have John Hunt Senior, coachman, who was born in a very small village in Warwickshire and moved to Chatsley in 1883. And my other great great granddad was James Green, who was a shepherd. And he was born in Grimley and moved to Chatsley around 1880. Not sure exactly of the year. So I've split the talk up into two halves, into the Hunts and Greens, and those are the two key figures that brought the two families together. I'm not expecting to take all that in, that's a very simplified family tree, but I've tried to put in from John Hunt, senior, 1833, through to my father, Dennis Green. So the link through. I've also highlighted, because I do talk about war, members of the family that were killed in action during the First World War. And I said that it was fitting that I was here tonight giving this talk. And the person that built this hall was a very interesting character called William Wicks Finch. And he was responsible for building this hall and put the money up for it. Now, there is some more information at the back on William. He had quite an interesting career. But he was born the son of a tailor down in Devon. He then somehow managed to get himself to Cambridge. And after that, he went to teach in Cheshire. Now, while he was in Cheshire, he met a lady called Emily Perry, who was the daughter of a very wealthy salt, rock salt mine owner. And he married Emily and got very well into the family, very well liked by Josiah, even though he'd come from humble beginnings. And in the end, he became the executor of his will. Now, Josiah died in 1869, and at that point, William Wicks Finch became a very wealthy man. And he then moved back to Warwickshire and took up the curacy at a small church in a town, a little village called Barchester. So that's the background as to William Wicks Finch. Now, while he was there, one of the Hunt families, one member of the Hunt family, became his coachman. So Birmingham is a small town, just south of ships and on south. So if we look at the census in 1881, John Hunt, and I'll call him John Hunt Senior, was the coachman for William Wicks Finch. I've done a transcript there of the family. So John Hunt had married a lady called Hannah Steele, and had had six children. So in 1881, he was still working in Birmingham for William Wicks Finch. Now, William Wicks Finch had always wanted to own a large country estate. He wanted to stop working and be a, a beneficiary to an area. So he bought the monks. Now, why he bought it, how he bought it, you know, why he chose there, we're not sure. But he bought the monks, and with that, John Hunt Senior, the coachman, his family, <coughs> came with him. So he brought the family with him. And while he was here, 
William Mixkin was then carrying out a lot of unpaid duties. Now we know the timing that John Hunt came to Chelsea. It was 1883. The reason for that is, and I know you can't read that, but this is the Hillpool School Register of 1883 and 1884. If I've pulled the part out, at the top, there's John Hunt Senior at the Monk's Lodge. Then there's John Hunt, who is my great granddad, Major Henry Hunt, Joseph Hunt, and at the bottom, James Hunt. Now, one of the things in doing my research, the difficulty, is the repetition of the names. <coughs> so we've got Williams and Johns, and John Hunt particularly was a very repetitive name. It makes it very difficult. But we know now from there their exact dates of birth, and we know that they came to Hill, they went to Hillpool School, and they were living at the monks. So in 1891. John is still the coachman, he's living at the, at the lodge, and his son John is a carpenter's apprentice. Now, if we move forward to 1901, John had married Ellen Pardo and had moved to Bluntington. And he was working at this time for George Bedell, the wheelwright. And we now can see, hopefully, at the monks, Hannah Hunt and her son James. The reason I brought this up is that below, and you may not be able to, I will move it to this one. We now see William Mix Finch at the monks, and you notice that he's got four servants. So James is, Hunt is living at Monks Lodge, and lo and behold, he married Florence Sandals, who was one of the servants at the moment. Looks very fancy today, doesn't it? But I'm sure back in the day it would have been a much less grand and a lot of people living there. So now if we move forward to 1911, John and Ellen are now living in the village. So they moved from Huntington, and we now see that they've had four children. Edith, Cecil, Nellie, and Harry Leslie. Unfortunately, Harry Leslie only lived four years. So this is the picture that I really like. Everybody see it? <coughs> so this is outside Batch Cottage, Batch Cottages, and it's 1912. <coughs> so we've got Edith, who would have been 11 at that time, <coughs> Cecil, who used to call an uncle Sis, and young Mary. Now, next door to that was actually a shop. So John Hunt was not only was he working as a wheelwright, but he and his wife were also running a small shop. And as you look with a magnifying glass, you can just see above the door, John Hunt licensed to sell tobacco. Now that shop, I can't remember that shop. But what I do remember, as a young child, is visiting that house where we called her grand, she was my great grand, lived. And that would have been around 1956, 57, 58. And I remember going into a very dark room. Grand would always be sitting in front of the range, it was an old range, so dressed in black. And <coughs> One thing that I do remember, and it was very scary, was that where the shop had been was now a sort of a parlour room, and in there were case, glass cases of animals and birds. And to a seven, eight-year-old, these were very, very spooky. <laughs> now, I never found out where they came from. I know where they went, but into the, they were scrapped. And I can remember the day that happened, when the house was cleared, and all these cages were just smashed and thrown away. My one theory is that they came from the monks. Because John Hunt's dad had been there as coachman, maybe that they were given to them 
I can't see that they would have afforded them. So that is a little bit of a mystery. It's another interesting, uh, interesting to me. This is my nan, Edith Hunts, and this is her, her labour certificate issued in 1915. And there it's saying that at 13 years of age, she's been to school long enough to go and work. Now, on the right hand side, and again, you probably can't see it, what it says is that she has made 350 attendances at school every year for five years. Now, I think I'm reading that right. That means that they had 15 days holiday. And maybe somebody can you know, say that's not right, but it says very clearly 350 attendances. So we now move on to 1921, and this is from the latest release census. And this tells us quite a lot. Um, because we get more details now of what they were doing, who they were working for. We can see, I don't know whether you can actually see it, but John Hunt, so this is John Hunt Jr. now, he's a wheelwright. He's also working at the flour and wood mills in Chelsea, working for Mr. Seeger. So that gives all that information. So he's doing several jobs. And Edith Hunt, my nan now, is at home, she's a dressmaker. And I've pulled this one out because in 1861, and I don't know whether you see it, he's nine, he's a plowboy. So I know they started work early, but I think that's quite interesting. Now Joseph, he, and this is all this complicated, he also married called Hannah. So later on, there were two Anna Hunts in Chelsea and married her in 1875. Shortly after that, he moved up to Lancashire and looking through the evidence that I've got, some of the Hunt family had already moved up to work on a farm called the Falls Farm up in Lancashire. And how he you know, how they originally found the jobs there, I really don't know. But so he moved up there and he was working on the farm. And while there, they had two children, Louise and Frederick. They then moved back to Warwickshire and they had more children. And then they moved to Chatsley, to Friars Farm. I surmise that John Hunt, who was working as the coachman, had found some work there for him, so he came to Chatsley. So quite a convol convoluted route, but it just shows how people were coming to move around, how, Mark, how the whole agriculture was changing, and he moved back and moved into Chatsley. And again, I've got Hillpool Records, which is very detailed, and there's the children, and they moved in 1887. They were at school between 1887 and 1888. So this ties in when he actually moved. And William, a little bit later, William was in 1892. And he was born in Chatsworth. So we move on now to the effect that war has had on the Hunt family, and we'll move on to the Green family afterwards. William joined the Worcestershire Regiment in 1911. So he wasn't called up for the First World War. What I believe is that being here, there was limited work, and also someone he knew, and I'll come on to that in a minute, had already joined the Worcestershire Regiment four years earlier. So he joined as a regular soldier in 1911. And he, in 1911, he was based at Norton Barracks. We then know that he came and went to France and sadly was killed in 1917, six, uh, 1916. So. Just talking about other members of the Hunt family, and this was great, great 
this is great granddad John's young brother, Major Henry. Now, I never found out why he was called Major Henry. It seems a very strange name. There's no family link at all. So Major Henry, again, started life here as a working as an agricultural labourer. But I think that was not particularly what he wanted to do. So he took a service position down in Reading, working for a solicitor called Gilbert Clare. He then came back here and got married <coughs> and went back down to Reading and worked for Gilbert's relatives. And there were three player sisters. And he stayed down there and he died down there. Now just there the were some stories that maybe the players were the players for cigarettes and uh, that isn't true. The players were wealthy ladies because their father had been a very successful industrial chemist. I'm sorry, there's no link to, to that. I've just now got some photographs that I like and I'll just go through those. So this is great gran, or gran Ellen, and this is a very nice one of the daughter, my aunt Edith, in 1932. Now, I rather like this um, from the archives. It's John and Ellen in their beach attire. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, there is a bit of leg there, which probably was found out. I can't date it exactly, but John died in 1939, so I'm I'm reckoning that it's around the 1930s. Now, if you notice, oh, John has got his customary pipe. And that, I'm not sure he didn't go to bed with it, but he always seemed to, to wear it. Again, I've got a look at one of Ellen there in 19, around 1945. And this is my uncle Cecil's wedding in 1936. Oh, look, John's got his pipe again. I mean, how, who would have a pipe at a wet scene photograph? It's just, um, you know, very interesting. And if you look closely, that's my granddad, and that's my nan. So another wedding, this is young James. James was the youngster of the family, got married in 1942. Uh, by then, of course, John had died. And there is Gran looking very resplendent. Again, always, while John had his pipe, Ellen always had her hat and had a wide range of hats. Talking of hats, we don't have any photographs of John the coachman or anything. But what we still have in the family is his top hat with its case. Now that must be well over 140, 150 years old. And it survived us as kids dressing up and playing with that. It's very small. Uh, as kids, we could put it on. Um, and it just shows. So that is our reminder of John the Coachman. Right, so that's a very brief resume of the Hunt family. Um, I have to make it brief. We now talk, look on to the Green family. And this is the family tree. I don't expect you to memorize it. Again, we've got the people who died. Now, I said in my little resume that went out that there was a little sort of mysterious twist to the tail. I shouldn't be agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> Who should I be? I'm not sure. I don't really know. The reason for that is that my great grand, Elizabeth Green, um, how can I put this delicately, um, <laughs> had two children out of wedlock. Um, not necessarily uncommon in those days. But we have no real idea who the father or fathers were. So we have George Green and William Green, my grandfather, were both born with Elizabeth as the mother. So George 
He was born in 1887, and he was born in the workhouse in Kidderminster. And the birth certificate, which I have, there's no name for the father, it's just blank. And then, three years later, Elizabeth was with child again. This time she moved to live with her sister Alice in Stanbridge. And I, I traced it all the way through, I followed where she was, and she gave birth to William, my granddad. So we really have no idea who the fathers were. So I had no idea growing up. This was never ever discussed in the family. I had no idea of who Elizabeth had married later on. Uh, it was just so Elizabeth then married William Sayers. Now, it was 12 months after William was born, William Green. Was he the father? I don't know. If, if he had been the father, why wasn't he on the certificate? I don't really know why. Or did he feel that, you know, he was working, he was a lodger at the farm, but we probably won't know. Now, Elizabeth Sayers then went on with <coughs> two more children, Frederick and Nellie Sayers. And I had no idea about this. None of us did in the family. So this is the Green family stepping back in 1881. James and Sarah, so that's my great great granddad. And at the bottom is Frank Green, who was born in Chatsley Corbett. James had been in, born in Grimley. He'd moved around. He was a chef, so he'd moved around. Elizabeth, who was my great grandmother, she had been born in Wollaston. This was when the trail started to get very complicated because the way that the censuses were filled out was very misleading. And anybody who's done any family research understands how complex it can be. So here we have 1891, we've got James Green, who's my great great granddad. We've got his sons, Alfred and Frank. Then we've got George, who's shown as the grandson, which is technically correct but he's George Green. We've then got William Sayers and Elizabeth Sayers, Nate Green, and William Sayers, who's actually five months old. So he's there, he's a Sayers, but only I think because of the way they filled it in. Now the transcript of that was even more complex because when you search on the I'm a pastor of Winter Street, you always they search and you find what the transcript is. Well, the transcript was Laius. So William Laius, Elizabeth Laius, and William Laius. So <coughs> the trail you can't see it, but it actually said at the workhouse. Boy, no father. <coughs> this time he's born in no name for the father. So if we move forward now to 1901, so now William and Elizabeth, George Sayers, who's really George, William Sayers, who I'm not sure who is, and Frederick James Sayers, who is William and Elizabeth's son. So if you look at 1911, it gets even, even worse because William Sayers and Elizabeth, his wife, are there. It's William Green now, but he's a boarder at the house. And Nellie says is the daughter. And if you actually look at the census, it's William says, Elizabeth says, and it was William says, but it's been crossed out and something's been changed to Green. So who knows who was who in those days? Okay, so now I'm going to move on to World War One and the effect that it had on, primarily on the green side. I've already talked about William Hunt, but it had a major impact on my side of the family. And anybody interested, there is a book at the bottom there on the table, happy to give a look at, which puts all the details in. So George Green, he actually joined the army in 1907. And again, like William Hunt, 
I can imagine that there's very little work for him. Maybe things at home were a little bit difficult because his mother had married somebody, they got other children. Um, he joined up in 1907, joined the Worcesters, and he went out to India. And he was on active duty out there. When war was declared in 1914, his battalion were called back, and they actually came back to um, Warwickshire to near Leamington. And the various numbers of troops all came back and they all collected there. So when he was in Warwickshire, they all billeted and they were inspected by King George. Now I thought that King that George meets King George again. When George was in India, he met King George when he was made King Emperor in 1911. <coughs> and George, after being in Warwickshire, all the troops were sent out to Gallipoli. Now I'm not going to dwell on the, the horrors of Gallipoli um, and the, all the stories that have been written of what it was. George's battalion were in the Battle of Prithia Vineyard, and he was killed there. In four hours, nearly 800 soldiers of the 4th Battalion were killed, 768. There were only officers and men, there were only 800 in the battalion. And it achieved absolutely nothing. And he's, he's buried out there. And there is a memorial in Worcester Cathedral to the fourth, to the members of the battalion who were killed around uh, in the Great War. Fifteen hundred officers and men were killed, as for, totally in the fourth battalion. Now we come on to Granddad William Green, maybe. Now, William had worked here as an agricultural labourer, but he was very good with horses, and he'd worked um, at Winterfold and showed great aptitude to working with the horses in, in the fields. But he wanted a steadier job, and so he decided to move. And he got a job with Great Western Railway. And these are two references I've got, one written by Winterfold Farm and the other by the vicar saying what an upright and sober character he was. So in 1913, he actually moved to work at the station. But that was very short-lived because in 1914, he signed up. Now, I can't prove it, but I think that he may have seen some type of advertisement like this, where they were looking for men that were good with horses. So he joined the Army Service Corps and in 1914, and he went down to Hampshire, and he was there training recruits. And I just, I love this photograph because there's Granddad and these young recruits, and he's teaching them the ways with horses. And we have to remember just how many horses there were in the First World War and how many lost their lives. More than 8 million horses were killed. Now, that photograph I've just shown was actually on the front of the postcard. And the back of the postcard is addressed to a Miss Nellie Sayers at East Coast Cottages, which is just up the road there. And there it says, Dear sister, in answer to your recent letter, I'm fine here and I'll be back soon. That's a very brief thing. So he calls her dear sister. But she's obviously his, well, maybe his half-sister. We really don't know. Just before so long ago, which is where he three years of the war, they assembled at Newbury Racecourse. And I have this lovely group photograph of his company, the 208th company, it was the Horse Transport Company, Army Service Corps. And there's William, very near, you see, to the officers. So by then, he had really shown that he was a very 
capable soldier. Now this is in Salonica, and although the others are sitting down very low, he was very tall. And this is around 1917 in Salonica, and that's solving a life, a lice infestation in Salonica. The conditions out there were, they must have been horrendous because they had incredibly cold winters, incredibly hot summers. And that's so on if in winter. In the summer, it was unbearable. It was very humid, very hot. And Grandad had several relapses of malaria, which I believe had a major impact on the shortness of his life. Yes, and when I found the record, I noticed that in the corner, there was a squash mosquito. <laughs> so I, I suspect it was when it was done in Salonica. So if we look now, Williams come back home, 1921. So William, William Sayers and Elizabeth Sayers are there. We've got Nellie Sayers, Frederick Sayers and William Green. So William was very much involved with the village. He was involved with the youth club, with the football team, and there he is in 1924. This is a nice picture of William and Edith around 1942. One of the big problems I have is, and I guess a lot of other people do, is that why didn't they write on the back of the photographs who they were and when they were born? So a lot of it is guesswork, but I'm I know that William died in 1947. Uh, it's much later, 1973, and there's Nan receiving her award. She was very much involved with village life as well, secretary to the endowed to the school, and also she was a sister in the order, the ancient order of foresters. I'd now like to <laughs> step back um, to Frank Green. And Frank Green is not one of the well-known members of Chatsley, and he's not on the board. But he was born in Chelsea. He was Elizabeth's brother. So he's one generation above my granddad. So he's my great uncle. Now, he was born in Chelsea, but then he moved up to Sheffield. And again, it was moving for work. So here he is in 1901. He's moved from Chelsea. And I brought this up because he had this lovely job. He was a part of the night soil. Oops. Everybody knows what that is. Yes. <laughs> Not the most pleasant of jobs. Uh, but he moved to get work. Again, the work in the, in the countryside was becoming difficult. And he's married with one daughter. So here he is in Rotherham in 1911. And he's still a carter, but he's moved up. He's a carter for a brewery now. But again, the census helps us because he's born, showing that he's born in Chelsea. So if I go back whoops, to his death, he was in Mesopotamia and he died in 1917. He died on the 13th of April. And I checked back. Friday, it was Friday the 13th. But he'd made his will in 1915. And this was the first time I'd actually seen a soldier's will that had been made in the field. Now, now you probably can't see the details of it, but this was his informal will. Now, he had got a wife and six children. He didn't need to go to war. He was in Rotherham, but he joined the Worcestershire Battalion and fought and died. Now, he's not on the board because he wasn't living here when he went. So I, I just wanted to bring that in because I think it's important that there's another member of the family I have no idea about. Just about that. Moving quickly on to World War II. I did say that war and work had a major impact on our lives. And it's true. Clacton, May 1940. A German bomber 
looking to lay mines off the south of the east coast, had to make a crash landing. And crashed into a number of houses, including the headmaster's house and girls high school. Several people on the ground were killed and all the pilots were killed. Why is that relevant? Because my mum to be, our mum to be, was at that school at the time and she was evacuated. So a month later, around 50 girls from Clacton High School, and that's actually a picture of her there with her friend, packed up their little case, got on the train and came to Kidderminster Station where they were just basically there and people would say, yes, I'll have those and I'll have those and I'll have those. And as it happened, Margaret and Edna were picked by Jim Meredith of Woodlands. So they came from the station, they've been travelling all day, and they came to this house with no power, um, candles, and they then spent the next two years going to school, but also working on the farm. And when I read the some of the things that they did, it, it didn't seem to be that it was my mum, because she was creosoting chicken sheds. And in one, one of the stories, so they were there waiting with their sticks to kill the rabbits when, as they came out from cutting the corn. And I can remember that as kids, seeing that, though, but it didn't really reflect on my mum. So while she was there, there was a young man who was learning, he just left school, and he was learning to be an insurance man. He with his boss, and they met these two ladies. The <coughs> young man was my dad. And at that point, this was about 1940, mum would have been 14. But there was a, I think an instant uh, attraction, call it what you will. I don't know exactly what went on uh, over the next 18 months. But dad then called up and into the Second World War. All the way through, they corresponded with very, very long letters on a whole range of topics. Um, now, Dad, and the, that's a picture of Mum on the left, and her friend Edna, and Grace Meredith with a very young cue. Dad joined the RAF and the SC Rescue. He was stationed out in Pembroke Dock for two years. And actually one of the very, we tended to think that he was, wasn't in much danger, but actually it was one of the most dangerous places in the UK from a point of targeting from the Germans. Not only were there all the southern flying boats, but there were huge fuel depots there, and they, they were bombed. But he survived that in 1944, sent to West Africa, which, a bit like Salonika, was not exactly the best place on earth. Very hot, very humid, a lot of very nasty fighting things. So that's Dennis, 1944, in West Africa. Now, some of the letters that he wrote, and we can't actually repeat today because they would be considered non PC. Although at the time they were considered uh, okay. And he was still there when VE Day. So he didn't actually get back for VE Day. They did have one out in West Africa, but he didn't come back till late in 1945. And he came back to Lyme Regis and was stationed there uh, for a number of months. So here we've got Dewey in West Africa. He was coxswain on air sea rescue launches and also tenders that would go out to his flying boats. So he came back, he was stationed in Lyme Regis, and the love of his life would go and visit him. And he was also a very accomplished artist, so I've just included that. This is the son of the printed. And they got married in 1947. 
And that really is the end of my story. Thank you.